Welcome to Information Service Engineering. This is lecture number two, Natural Language Processing, part one. In this section of the lecture, we are going to talk about morphology. What is morphology? In linguistics, morphology is the study of words, how these words are formed, and also their relationship to other words in the same language. Okay, so how are words formed? basic building block in a language, we saw this already, are words. But sometimes also words are complex and constructed. So there is a more basic, let's say, element that we have to consider. And these are the so-called morphemes. Morphemes are the smallest grammatical units in a language, which means the smallest meaningful unit in a language. And among those morphemes, we also distinguish two different types. There are so-called simple words. These are words that only consist of a single morpheme, like work, run, build. And there are complex words which have an internal structure, which means they consist of two or even more morphemes, like, for example, the word morphology. Morphology consists out of a so-called root, which is morph, and an affix, ology which creates the composite word morphology. You can also make this clear in the so-called morphological parse tree. Morphological parsing, we will see this right away, is to find out how a word is constructed. And you do this by deriving a tree. So morphology is a noun, which consists of a noun root, which is morph, and an affix, which is ology. And here morph, and ology are these minimal grammatical units. So they are the morphemes. Okay, let's have a closer look at these morphemes. First of all, let's look at the root. The root usually is a core part of a complex word. This is the part that carries the major component of its meaning. On the other hand, the affix usually is a so-called bound morpheme which is part of a complex word, but does, does not belong to any lexical category, which means the affix or the bound morpheme, it's no verb. It's also not a noun or an adjective. It's simply an affix, which only makes sense if you connect it to a root, for example. So what we have to distinguish here are so-called free morphemes and bound morphemes. First of all, the free morphemes, we know already, these are the simple words. They consist only of one morpheme, like house, work, high, chair, rep. So you see, the type of the word doesn't matter. It's only one morpheme. And bound morphemes, then these are words that have to be attached to another morpheme to receive some meaning. Like, for example, in the complex word unkindness, un, and ness are bound morphemes that by themselves don't have much meaning. They require a root, like for example, kind. And by unkind, so by this kind of affix, the prefix un, what you do there is you negate the meaning. So that's the complement of the original meaning. And by kindness, what you make there, you, you create from an adjective, which is kind. You say kindness, you create a noun out of it. So these are the purpose of these bound morphemes here. And as I already told you, an is put in front of the root, so it's a prefix, and ness is put behind the root, so therefore it is a suffix. Okay, we have already talked about so-called morphological parsing. And as I have already told you, this is the process of determining the morphemes of course, and their purpose and from which a given word is constructed. And they can be visualized in the form of a tree diagram, which is then called a morphological tree. So, for example, here we know this already, the past tree or the morphological tree of morphology. So this is a noun consisting of morph, which is also a noun, and an affixology. And to see also or to demonstrate some really complex word in English. So this is, I guess, one of the longest English complex words that you can find. So it's anti-disestablishmentarianism. So you see there lots of affixes that go to one stem here. So the root is established and everything else is put around it. 
Okay, in morphological parsing, what you do there is, and you do this not only in English, you can do this in many languages, words can be made up from a main stem, which carries the basic dictionary meaning, plus one or more affixes that carry then more grammatical information. And you distinguish then the surface form, which is the word, as it occurs in your text, and the so-called lexical form. In the lexical form, what you see there is, okay, you see how exactly the word has been constructed. So it consists of a root, which is here morph, and this is a noun, and you put an ad affix in there. And the lexical form can also be visualized with the help of this parse tree. So morphological parsing is nothing else but the problem of extracting this kind of lexical form from a given surface form. So this is the definition of morphological parsing. And there are lots of applications making use of uh, morphological parsing. Anything which does grammatical parsing in natural language processing will typically involve morphology parsing as a prerequisite then to grammatical parsing. Uh, also search engines, you know this, if you are looking for fox, of course also documents containing the phrase foxes should be returned and vice versa. And also for spell checking, spell checking can also benefit from morphology simply by determining whether a given word you know, is really a possible word form, so then it's potentially written correctly, or whether it can't exist because, yeah, you know, there is no morphological parsing for that surface form that you want to fill in here. So these are only a few NLP tasks, like for example, information retrieval, or here also um, spell checking, where morphology or morphological parsing makes sense. Okay, so let's have a look at how now these words are constructed out of a stem and affixes. There exist rules, the so-called morphological rules. In many languages, complex works are built out morphemes via three different variations of rules. One is the so-called derivation rule. There, so-called derivational morphemes are used. Then you have compounding and you have inflection, inflection also with inflectional morphemes. So what are these three kind of rules? We will go through them in detail. Let's start with derivation. Derivation is the process of forming now new nerve words out of existing words by simply adding derivation, uh, derivational morphemes as affixes. As a result also the meaning of the resulting word is different from that of its root. And very often also the word category, the word type changes. So you can make from a word, you can create, let's say a noun or vice versa. Simple example here, we have the word stem teach, which is a verb to teach. And you add there the affix er and it becomes teacher. And now the verb has become the resulting word, a noun. So ER is a derivational morpheme, which has added to the stem as an affix, and the resulting word then is a noun. So this is a, a typical derivation, because here also the word changes its meaning, and also the category changes the meaning from teaching to the teacher, the person who teaches. So this is derivation. What is compounding? Compounding is quite simple. So what you do there is you combine simply already existing words into new ones. So we do often that. So in, in German, this is a, a really nice practice to create and to invent new words. Interestingly, so here also in English, um, there is no affixation, so no affixes, but each of the parts can be assigned a specific word category. So for example, take the word lawnmower. So you have two words, lawn, and more, both are nouns and put together the lawn mower, of course, it's also a noun. You can combine here, for example, a proposition and a noun, up, shot. And what comes up then? The upshot is a noun again. Or blow dry, the blow, it's a noun. And to dry, it's a verb. And to blow dry then in the end might be a verb again. Or you have here a proposition and an adjective, over, grown and overgrown is an adjective too. So can you already make out a rule of what category is the resulting compound? 
by simply looking at these kind of rules? Look close. So what exactly is the factor that determines the result? Exactly. It's here, the so-called header. So the header compound that you have here um, determines the outcome, the result, and the word category of the result, as you see here. So this is compounding. And then we are missing a third one besides derivation and compounding. There is also inflection. What is inflection? With inflection, what you can do is you, you modify a word to indicate specific aspects of the grammatical function of a word, such as example, the tense. So for example, you can say the past tense, present tense, future tense, and you do this by inflection. You can, for example, express different cases, different voices, aspects, persons, numbers, genders, or moods with the help of inflection. In English, inflection is the predominantly expressed via affixation with inflectional morphemes, but not only in English, also other languages like, for example, Turkish are using lots of inflections. Let's have a few examples. And of course, for this, we are looking at the English language. So in English, you only have eight inflectional morphemes that are quickly told. So first of all, for example, the noun plural s. Simply to create a plural, what you do, you add an s for all regular nouns. So for example, he has three desserts. So you add simply the s to the word, to the noun dessert. That's the noun plural s. There is another s that you can add to a noun. It's the so-called noun possessive s. And this means, of course, you want to say that this is Betty's dessert. For this, you need also an apostrophe. And then you add an s behind an apostrophe to Betty. And then this is a noun possessive s. But s is also what uh, used for verbs. So for example, for the present tense, simply to express that Bill usually eats dessert or Bill eats a dessert now, then an S is added for eat. So this is the verb present tense S. For the past tense, for regular verbs, you add ED. So he baked the dessert yesterday. This is the verb past tense ED. And then there is also a verb past participle. He has always eaten dessert. So you add EN behind the verb. And also there is a verb present participle. This is ing. So he is right now eating the dessert. So eating. This is another inflectional morpheme. And there is a adjective comparison. So comparative er. This means um, you add to an adjective er to express a comparative. So his dessert is larger than mine. So you have large and you add simply er. And large of k, it, it ends with an e and you want to add er. So this means this, you don't add a double e. So the rule there is, this is a lexical or syntactical rule. This becomes in the end a single e. So you add er to the adjective to make a comparison to something bigger, larger, whatever. So that's comparative. And one stage beyond, then you have the adjective superlative. This is est. And you add EST to an adjective to say her dessert is the largest. And these are all the eight inflectional morphemes that exist in the English language. Okay, since both are expressed inflection and derivation via adding affixes, this is sometimes difficult to distinguish. So therefore, we are looking at a few examples. However, there are also rules. So one thing is, of course, to distinguish whether, you know, adding an affix is in derivation or in inflection. Derivation often changes the category of the root, while inflection never changes the word category. On the other hand, derivation changes completely the meaning of the root. So you can add, for example, um, in or an in front of an adjective and you simply switch the meaning completely, you turn it to its negative. This is something what inflection not does. And derivation usually is applied before inflection. This is, of course, interesting for morphological parsing. But as promised, let's look at a few examples and then we can distinguish inflection from derivation.
So inflection here now usually is used in green and derivation is used in red. Let's have a look at the first sentence. The farmer's cows escaped. Okay, we have farmer and farmers. You see this, this is a possessive S. And even more, to farm is a verb and farmer makes a noun out of a verb. So this is the one who farms, the farmer. So the farmer's cows, cows is plural S, escaped. So this is past tense, ED. Let's look at the next one. It was raining. Yeah, and you see here to rain, of course, ING is added. So this is inflection. Those socks are inexpensive. Sock, sock, so this is plural inflection. And inexpensive, typical derivation, because you have expense. And then you add expensive, for example, to make an adjective out of it. And then you turn around the meaning and say inexpensive. Next one, Jim needs a newer copy. First of all, need, needs. So this is present tense S to a verb. New, newer, so this is comparative to um, an adjective. Both are, of course, inflections and no derivations. Number five, the strongest rower continued. So you have strong and you make a superlative out of it, strongest. So this means inflection. And you have the row or to row, so this is a verb, and you add er, rower, the one who rows. So here you change the word category, so it's clearly derivation. Last one, continue. This is then simply past tense for a verb. Number six, the pit bull has bitten the cyclist. Okay, first one, to bite, bitten. So this is inflection, of course, and uh, because this is uh, the, the participle. And then you have to cycle, and the one who cycles is the cyclist. So this is clearly a derivation because the word category has changed. Next one, number seven. She quickly closed the book. Quick, quickly. So from an adjective, we derive an adverb quickly by adding ly. So this is a derivation. And to close and closed, this is again the past tense of a verb. Last one, the alphabetization went well. So alphabetization is even more complex. As you see here, what you have here, you have the alphabet, which is a noun. You make a verb out of it to alphabetize. And then again, you make a noun out of it, alphabetization. Complex, but since the word category always changes here, you clearly see this is derivation. So don't worry, we will make even more of these exercises than in the lab course. So this is clearly something you should be able to do. So this is also not very difficult. Of course, for a computer program to understand the meaning of a word, to know about the rules of morphology, of course, is really, really important. However, these rules determine in the end, of course, how word categories are derived or how the tense or the mood or the number of, for, for example, can be derived. What we did not see so far is the meaning of the word stem of the root. And first of all, we have to get to the root. So we have to strip off all affixes and find the root. And these processes to find the root or let's say a normalized form of the original word of the surface form, this is called stemming or another process is lemmatization. What's the difference? Stemming is quite easy. So this is the process of reducing inflected or sometimes derived words simply to their word stem. What you do there, you strip away all affixes and then you have the stem. So therefore this is stemming. Lemmatization on the other hand, this is the process of grouping together the inflected forms of a word. So they can be analyzed as a single item which is identified by their so-called lemma or the dictionary form. So this is a normalized form of the word. This is usually referred to as the lemma or the dictionary form. So let's see, for example, you have the word better, which is a comparative of good. So good is there the dictionary form. So to derive this form or to, to create from better to come to good, this is lemmatization. So for two of the words you see also here, they're um, 
morphological parse. So cat and beta again as a reminder are the surface forms. And here you see the lexical form where we have for cat, for example, this is a noun and we add simply the plural s or for better what we do here, we have good as an adjective and we add a comparative, which completely then changes the form of the word and makes from good to better. Okay, this was very briefly uh, a very, very short introduction into morphology. So what you should memorize from this uh, lecture or from this part of the lecture, first of all, that the smallest units we are talking about in morphology are morphemes. These are the smallest grammatical units of, uh, from which, you know, in a language words are formed. And we distinguish between free morphemes, which themselves have a meaning and themselves are simple words and so-called bound morphemes which only makes sense if they are added to a stem to change then somehow also the meaning of the stem. The process of deriving a lexical form from a surface form, which means to find out how a word has been constructed is called morphological parsing. And by that we are creating a so-called morphological parse tree. So remember we had surface form. This is the complete complex word that you read. And we had lexical form where you see, okay, this is the stem, which is a specific category of word and then you have added specific affixes which have of course a specific function to change the word then in the end and the rules according to which you know a word can be constructed and changed we have seen later on the morphological rules which are usually inflection derivation and compounding and if i want to derive let's say a normalized form of all of these different variations of a specific word, then I can use the process of stemming, which simply strips away all of the affixes, or I use lemmatization, which tries to derive uh, a standardized form, the so-called words lemma, or the words dictionary form from the surface form. So this was basic morphology. What we'll do in the next lecture, we will see how natural language processing can be applied and we will look at a few natural language processing applications to get a bit familiar with the tasks that are solved in NLP.